So good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our first artist talk of the new year. Um, my name is Maria Pio, and I am the co-director at the Godwin Turnback Museum at Queens College, where I oversee administration and education programs such as this one. My co-director and curator, Louise Weinberg, is also joining us this evening, as is Stephanie Lee, Museum Operations Assistant. Um, if you have not had a chance yet, I do invite you after the program to visit our website at www.gtmuseum.org for a closer look at the current exhibition titled Getting There. There you will also find information about upcoming programs and events and a virtual look into past exhibitions and programs that we've done. I want to take a moment to thank our donors and funders, including friends of the Godwin Turnback Museum, the Avery Arts Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Museum Association of New York, Kofferberg Center for the Arts, and Queens College. Without their support, we would not be able to bring any of this programming to you all today. Tonight, I am very excited to welcome the two artists whose work can be seen in the museum's current exhibition, Getting There, Suzanne Slavic and Andrew Ellis Johnson. Now, I do wanna start off with a quick introduction of both of them. Suzanne Slavic and Andrew uh, Johnson are both artists and professors at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Suzanne um, Slavic's art and writing pursues empathic unsettlement through projects that reveal what we stand to lose after what we have lost already. She has exhibited internationally and most recently at Aratoi in New Zealand, University of Virginia's Rufin Gallery, Ecole Griffin Gallery in New York City, Princeton University's Bernstein Gallery, and the Chicago Cultural Center. Andrew Johnson examines both historical and contemporary social and political injustices, treating representation not as a hermetic, mimetic pictorial tradition, but as an agency to awaken and combat torpor. His projects appear internationally in galleries, electronic and video festivals, public collaborations, conferences, books, and journals, with the recent solo shows at SUNY Cortland's Dowd Gallery and UNC Chapel Hill's John and June Alcott Gallery. Both Johnson and Slavic <coughs> have participated in residencies and projects together through Poznan Academy of Art, the Blue Mountain Center, Bayum International Art Center in Egypt, sites of passage in Jerusalem, Ramallah, Pittsburgh, and Tsitsigua University in Beijing. Their ongoing body of work on immigrants and refugees has been presented at McDonough Museum of Art in Youngstown, Ohio, the Fed Galleries at KCAD in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Schmucker Gallery at Gettysburg College, Pennsylvania, and Stockton University Art Galleries in New Jersey. So I am so happy, and we, I know Louise and Stephanie were all thrilled to have and welcome you to this, both of you to this virtual space. Um, so without further ado, I will let you guys take it away. Okay, I'm just getting the proper view here. Okay. So first of all, Amber and I just wanna thank Louise Weinberg and everybody at the Godwin Turnback for bringing our show to Queens College. Uh, as Maria said, you know, earlier versions originated at the Fed Galleries in Grand Rapids, and, and then it was called Resort, and that traveled to the McDonough Museum in Youngstown, and then on to Gettysburg College, and then to um, Stockton University this past fall, and it will go to Wilkes University in PA next. So <clears throat> in our work, we are wrestling with the clash between two worlds. Uh, of security versus insecurity. And those two worlds are exemplified in this scene of vacationers who are encountering refugees coming ashore in Europe. And in 2016, when we made our video resort, that summer, over 3,700 died while crossing the Mediterranean. So when we're vacationing on beach resorts, the sea sort of lulls and mesmerizes us but that same sea is a last resort for migrants and refugees. And for them, the sea obviously is not about leisure. It's unpredictable and dangerous. Its shores might welcome or repel. And in resort, the, the boundless sea is weirdly stilled. Um, bodies that typically lounge on the beach chairs are absent or unavailable or unwilling to assist those bodies that are anxious, 
vulnerable, desperate bodies that may sink or be subsumed. In the video, the chairs are turned away from the sea to avoid those heaved on its waves. And we made the water churn across those empty seats to make the turmoil both private and collective. So the seascape is severed into these single frames of, the, of each seat, but it flows continuously across the row. So while the invisible surges into visibility, the crisis is still not at bay. In 2016, we saw and were quite moved by the exhibit called The Warmth of Other Suns at the Phillips Collection in DC. And one reviewer, Jason Farrego at the New York Times, quotes the philosopher and political theorist, Hannah Arendt, who in her 1943 essay, We, Are Refu we Refugees said, quote, in the first place, we don't like to be called refugees. She had fled Germany a decade earlier without papers and lived in Paris as an undocumented migrant. And she was later sent to internment camps with other Jews. She escaped and made, made it to Portugal and eventually to the USA. And she describes the trauma, quote, hell is no longer a religious belief or a fantasy, but something as real as houses and stones and trees. Apparently nobody wants to know that contemporary history has created a new kind of human being, the kind that are put in concentration camps by their foes and in internment camps by their friends. This is an image by Richard Moss's uh, from his heat map series that was shot at a migrant center in Greece. So today the UN estimates that there are nearly 27 million refugees, about half of them are under age 18, and if you include the people forced to flee from their homes, the number of displaced people is at least 84 million. Each one of them has a right to safe asylum, according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was signed in 1948. Here is Guillermo Arias's aerial view of Honduran migrants heading to the USA four years ago. So for decades, the United States led the world in welcoming refugees, but since 2017, we have decreased resettlements more steeply than any other country. And over the last decade, the Mediterranean has been an epicenter of the refugee crisis. As of last fall, almost 1,400 have died in the Mediterranean, and there are politicians in Italy like Matteo Salvini, who has who have contested rescue operations, closed migrant centers, blocked rescue boats from docking, and have actually proposed fining Italians who rescue migrants at the risk of drowning. And last fall, Oscar Camps, who's the founder of the NGO Open Arms, attributed 811 deaths to stopping of five humanitarian vessels. So this is Kurt's, Curtis Taltz Santiago's Deluge, which specifically memorializes the preponderance of today's nearly 7 million refugees from Syria alone. And his images obviously are informed by the canonical shipwreck paintings such as Jericho's The Raft of Medusa, as well as by media images. Anna Bogiguian, who paints Syrian, uh, Syrians heading west from Beirut, her title state sums it up. They tied and put their hearts together. So the news is full of reports on more people left stateless. You may remember two years ago uh, when India declared millions stateless in the state of Assam because it was targeting its predominantly Muslim population. So Hannah Arendt is still right. Apparently, quote, no one wants to know. But we do want to know and we want everyone to know. And this show getting there is one way of knowing and not looking away. A lot of art, film and literature today misunderstands refugees as outsiders to the West, but refugees are not outsiders looking in. They are central actors in the writing and making of our global culture. Again, Arendt wrote that, quote, refugees represent the vanguard of their peoples if they keep their identity. Refugees have always been with us. Jason Ferrego, again in the New York Times, sums it up as stories of war and forced displacement, in fact, have shaped Western civilization since Virgil's Aeneid. The origin story of Rome is a tale of Mediterranean migration, departing from the coast of Anatolia, 
which is the starting point of many of today's Syrian refugees. And it foreshadows other societies founded by immigrants, evacuees, foundlings, and so-called aliens. In the West, refugees and immigrants like Hannah Arendt, Einstein, Freud, Adorno, and Claude Levi-Strauss have forever shaped how we understand art and society. There are too many to list, but we are all beholden to the influence of refugees, not just culturally, but economically, because the, you know, if the proof is in 2019, uh, 223 of the Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants and their children. And of those 223, 101 were founded directly by foreign born individuals. Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad were all refugees. The Thanksgiving holiday is a celebration of refugees who fled from England to the Netherlands and then to Plymouth Rock. So my threadbare paintings in this show, some of them are in this show, allude to the journey of immigrants and refugees. And what I was trying to do was to juxtapose both the harmonious and the meditative with the muck and the mire of realities on the ground. So I painted these patterned remnants of damaged carpets with clay slurries over layers of wet glue, which produces this kind of cracked earth effect. And through the fissures and torn holes of the carpets, we glimpse these open skies and unfurling clouds, which are derived from the art and cultures under assault, the kind of assaults and war conditions that generate refugees. So sometimes you have these intertwining forms like this pink lotus that kind of tries to reanimate maybe what has been lost through violence and unrest, and either suggesting the possibilities or the impossibilities of recovery. And some of the design sources come from carpets that have been transported and damaged themselves originally from Syrian or Turco-Persian or North African regions, and they now occupy German art museums. These I shot in Berlin. Um, and theirs is a geographic journey that parallels that of many refugees. So typically carpets are trodden upon in daily life, but I wanted these carpets to fly, becoming so-called magic carpets as kind of escapist vehicles for fantasy and dreams of a better place. But these carpets fray and they fail despite the hopes for rescue or restarting lives on stable, solid ground because these grounds are anything but stable. And also by invoking so-called magic carpets, I'm trying to acknowledge but also undermine the kind of exoticizing Orientalism that's still prevalent in the West by portraying the rug with the material of real earth, clay, instead of silk and wool. Because um, I think, you know, in times of trauma and crisis, even the most humble materials and functional design become extraordinary. So I'm hoping these carpets in perfect or wounded conditions might evoke what Dominic Lacapra, uh, who is a historian of trauma studies, he calls uh, this condition that I'm trying to evoke empathic unsettlement. And that, you know, these erosions that might embody deteriorating dreams or crumbling comforts or unraveling ideals or ideologies that have made such a mess of the world. So as I mentioned before, the plight of refugees is not a new phenomenon. Across time, the making of states and all their failures, that these have all prompted the besieged and persecuted to flee to neighboring states and often across many waters of the world. So my ghost ship series, focuses on sea vessels that bear the desperate, who hope for safe harbor. And my source imagery is derived from fables and myths and stories of peril and survival from both Western and Eastern cultures. So a lot of them come from stories of Noah's Ark as in this French version or this Persian version or this anonymous one, but also from the 15th century. And there are other rescue myths as well, such as the Mahajanaka uh, Jataka that symbolizes perseverance. The goddess that you see floating above is Mani Mikala, who guards the seas in Thai Buddhist mythology and floats above and she saves the prince Mahajanaka who's clinging to a plank. So the arcs and boats in my ghost ship series are either intact or wrecked, but they are always emptied of humanity. Now you see someone is in the source and now you don't. 
And this absence evokes the missing, those who Judith Butler calls the ungrievable. And she writes, quote, one way of posing the question of who we are in these times is by asking whose lives are considered valuable, whose lives are mourned, and whose lives are considered ungrievable. We might think of war as dividing populations into those who are grievable and those who are not. An ungrievable life is one that cannot be mourned because it is never lived. And that is, it is never counted as a life at all. So after modifying these scenes from my sources, I superimpose modern instruments of rescue like life jackets that either fill the decks or float around the wreckage or scatter to the winds. Occasionally ravens and doves carry them in their beaks, but they always arrive too late or withhold aid, just like we do. And then you will, if you're in the gallery or read the catalog, you will also see poetic fragments that accompany these works um, that also are paired with contemporary news accounts from the places that these source images come from. For example, this is a French manuscript illumination. So I quoted a 2017 headline uh, from The Guardian about um, events in Paris that said, police removed 2000 refugees and migrants sleeping rough in Paris. And then those kinds of news headlines are paired with poetry like this excerpt from Hussam Adin Mohammed's Andalusia of the Trains. He's a Syrian poet who's based in London, who read, recited this poem at, in Calais refugee camp, which is also called the jungle. And it's, I'm reading an excerpt. The mothers will ask us about the sea. We shall tell them about the sea and how it threw us to our death. So we plowed through Europe's fields in order to flip the dice of life. We shall tell how we crossed the Aegean Sea and were lost like Ulysses how we traveled the sea to a jungle in France and the rescuers surrounded us with barbed wire and presence. So the source for black art was created, black arc was created in Herat, which is now Afghanistan and Yasser Niksada, who's an Afghan poet living in Germany, wrote this one line at age 15. The dinghy sank and my heart hot for Europe went cold. For the actual piece that I called Ghost Ship, I chose lines from Lampedusa II by Eliza Griswold, her essay, Everyone is an Immigrant. It goes like this. A cross nailed from the ribs of your sunk ships, paper prayer scraps, one million calls to the wrong God. And I paired that with a Washington Post report about Italian forces ignoring a sinking ship of Syrian refugees. And then for Dark Ark, I quoted the most famous line from Warsan Shear's devastating poem, Home. She's a poet born to Somali parents in Kenya who grew up in London. And the most searing line for me is, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And I encourage you to read the whole poem. It's available online and it's just devastating. So since this came from a Thai image, I quoted an Amnesty International report from 2015 at the height of the Southeast Asian boat crisis, when the Thai Navy was refusing entry to boats who were carrying thousands of desperate Rohingya refugees. And the poet Ali Yohar, who is a Rohingya youth leader based in Delhi wrote in his poem, somewhere I am a meal of the sea. So the ghost ship series led to this trio called Dead Reckoning, and these are three inflatable boats that can be bought online for sport or recreation. And their model names refer to the blue sea, this is Atsuro Mare, or a bird of prey, this is sea eagle, or um, a distant planet, this is Saturn. And the ad for Atsuro Mare says, uh, now comes with free boat tubes cover to protect from damaging UV rays and to extend boat lifespan. It's great as a ship to shore dinghy or tender for a main ship. And the sea eagle is best suited for those wishing to have more roomy space. And the Saturn is the largest vessel in our budget price. So, you know, all these quoted selling features are benign, right? But they take on new meaning, or maybe they become meaningless when we think of such boats being used for desperate measures, taking on human cargo far above 
and beyond capacity, inadequate and ill-equipped for journeys that are certainly longer than a leisurely day on the water. And I wanted their reflective black bottoms to face us as kind of bottomless voids, asking, can we reckon with our own reflection? Do we like what we see? So of course, there is real mercy and generosity offered to many who are crossing borders, but there is also just so much antipathy and resistance. Refugee boats are caught up in both storms of nature and politics. Once they're afloat, they face the elements and human obstacles like the crimes of unscrupulous smugglers and the underworlds of societies that prey upon the undocumented, like the criminals who recently preyed upon Haitian refugees in Mexico. Refugees have been fired upon um, from, sorry, I think I'm off, hold on here, I'm, I'm ahead of my, refugees have been fired on from shore and at sea. Hmm? Yeah, um, and uh, far right movements in Europe who they wanna preserve you know, national identities and return to national uh, traditional Western values and anti-immigrant groups and governments vow to so-called stop the invasion and they disrupt rescue missions, block the boats loaded with North African migrants. They accuse uh, NGOs of colluding with traffickers to bring in enemies of Europe. All of that sounds awfully familiar, right? In our own country, because we have the same groups here um, who promote a white ethno state demanding stronger borders and more barriers. And they too are willing to thwart and even prosecute life-saving efforts like providing water to immigrants who are crossing the desert, all to advance a xenophobic agenda. Just back to the Mediterranean, since 2014, more than 23,500 migrants have died trying to cross that body of water. But we also have our own border deaths right here with a low estimate of 7,000 recorded between 1998 and 2020. But last year, was the deadliest on record with over 650 deaths of those trying to cross our border. So whether desperate people who are fleeing wars, violence, and poverty deserve to live or die, it's, it's just hard to believe that this is a partisan question in our country. Our last president, who shall remain unnamed, referred to migrants as animals who would, quote, infest our country. And he did everything in his power to shun, imprison, or deport them. Now, you know, Biden might speak more compassionately and he has enacted some measures in support of DACA and immigrants and migrants, but his administration is defending two of Trump's more inhumane immigration policies, which include the pandemic re uh, related border restrictions and the legality of family separations. Meanwhile, Turkey, Colombia, Uganda, and Pakistan, who have much fewer resources than we do, take in the most refugees, and Europe takes in far more than we do in proportion to our population. So I want my own work and the work that I admire of others to make us think about the consequences of withholding welcome or retracting welcome, of denying safe and humane harbor, whether it's on land or at sea. And instead of our cruel denial, and since we're from Pittsburgh, the home of Mr. Rogers and his famous song, I wish we would ask this instead and extend a more radical hospitality. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Andrew now. Stop sharing. Okay. So yes, I was just thanking uh, silently, apparently, <laughs> Louise Weinberg um, and Maria Pio and Stephanie Lee for their assistance in uh, bringing the show to yeah, Queens right. College. And if you are un if you're unable to see the exhibition, you might not be aware that the drawings I'm about to show are very large in scale, so up to ten feet tall or wide. Your body is meant to be able to have the room to enter into the scenes and spaces, so that when you're reading the image, it's a challenging and physical activity. This piece, Bound, introduces several themes in this cycle of drawing. Themes of emergence, fantasy, role reversals, reportage, the ghostly and ghastly, the inability to represent. The immigrant often is portrayed as a child, damaged, without power, a blank slate onto which we project our own fears. The boy is wrapped 
in one of those $1 mylar heat blankets frequently given to refugees. The treatment of the blanket stands for a state of abstraction that contrasts with the wanly rendered boy who imagines himself like Superman, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. The boy is bound to his circumstances. His wrist is bound with bandages. He imagines bounding into safety. I frequently resort to puns, both verbal and visual, ambiguous languages that force different conceptions, modes of representation, and psychological states to collide. Patrol features five children looking down upon their border patrol captives. They wear paper plate masks of superheroes, as do the lucky immigrant children who have earned a temporary stay in the US. The border patrol agents have lost their agency. Their examination of the apparition's documents seem ineffectual and inconsequential. For the next several images from the pieces, the adoration and the diptych fugue, I'd like to read an extended excerpt from A Refugee Again by the Vietnamese author Vu Tran. While the text was written after fugue was painted, it explicates much of what I hope the drawing evokes. I quote, in many ways, a refugee is like an orphan. She might literally be bereft of parents and of siblings too, but also the familial bonds of her homeland, her native community and culture and customs. Stripped of agency from the moment that she fled that homeland and dependent now on those who can protect her, she is frequently seen as childish, no matter how old she actually is. As a result, she is pitied for what she has suffered and the pity will diminish the heroism of her journey and all the choices that she made to survive and to complete it. For those who can never quite accept her, a refugee is like a ghost. To them, she's come from another world, an obscure and incomprehensible world, and now resides in the shadows of this one, an alien entity, an intruder. She can be invisible, even though her presence is felt. If she is seen, she might very well be seen through, a specter both present and distant, both acknowledged and denied. She can be feared even when she is not there. In that sense, she can be mythologized. She is a manifestation of the past and is a dark harbinger of the future. Like a ghost, her state of being to others and even to herself is ambiguous. Her identity, her goals and desires and intentions her place in the world she now inhabits, they are all as hazy as those memories of the world she was born into. So back to me, the visual sources for Fugue in the subsequent work come in part from contemporary journalism. I hope their execution allows us to look at the subjects anew, awry and again. For example, the poultry truck is one in which scores of immigrants suffocated in sweltering heat. The emergency first responders prepared for a disaster which had already come. The UNHCR refugee shantytown and camps are rendered based on journalistic documentation. Somewhere over the border, here the children have be somewhere over the border, the children here have become gods. They channel night and the force of gales, tossing their powerless would-be captors on a parachute that becomes the heavens. Children who are separated from their relatives by immigration and customs enforcement and border patrol agents invert the usual power dynamic. The children's attire, attire promises transport imprinted with sea creatures and freight trains colloquial known as la bestia, the beast, that have carried them in dream or in reality. Their masks, attire and postures draw upon a rich and self-sufficient culture. Mayan and Aztec iconography abounds, invoking the power of the Mesoamerican god Tustalapauca. Some agents wear flower pattern fatigues. Their scopes and surveillance gear are aimless. Others become Mexican lucha libre pro wrestlers in tights and tattoos, caught and tethered with beaded friendship bracelets. I guess the children learned that when you come up north, the natives like to receive cheap jewelry in exchange for residency rights. Sestalapauca is associated with the night sky and winds, hurricanes, enmity, discord, divination, sorcery, and strife. 
In creation myths, Tesselopalka is often shown with his lost right foot replaced with an obsidian mirror. Displaced and stateless peoples are often seen as stripped of culture, connection, profession, and the ability to care for each other or themselves. Somewhere over the border depicts migrants in their strength, possessing a past and dreaming a future. The next images are from Mist of the Magi. The US is the largest exporter of arms in the world, and it is particularly true in Central and South America. The arms sales that profit US gun companies are the same that led to the increase in violence that is causing the flight from the Northern Triangle countries to the US border in the first place. So Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico are those known as the Northern um, Triangle. The Quisiotic journey on Camelback does not lose its biblical associations in Christendom. Mist of the Magi also courts apocalyptic interpretation. Only a fraction of the world's refugees are resettled each year. So let me say that one more time, everybody. Only a fraction of the world's refugees are resettled each year. Far from vis visibility, nearly half are confined to camps, remaining displaced for an average of 17 years. I highly recommend Ben Rawlins's City of Thorns, a devastating nonfiction estimation of the world's largest refugee camp for narratives of particular residents' lives, what it's like to live without being able to work, without being able to leave the place that has forced you to be there in complete dependency. Glimpses of refugee experience conveyed through the media may fail to reveal the depth of loss and longing for family, home, and self-sufficiency. Ancient myths, epics, and novels like Jenny Erpenbeck's Go Went Gone and the Refugee Tales collection modeled on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales tell further stories of the perils of flight and return. Odysseus himself, take a look, he's right there under that sheep's uh, chin. You can see the nose kind of poking up and the mouth looking like it's uh, about to bite some of that sheep fur. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, Odysseus himself escaped from the Cyclops by clinging to and hiding under the belly of a sheep. Migrants today cling to tops of trains and undersides of trucks and planes, risking their lives as they try to save their lives. Mraja the Magi, is, uh, which is in the exhibition, is the mate to Mist of the Magi, whose images we just looked at. They each mock the hysterical hype of invasions, and terrorists, and bad people at the border. Instead, spirits riding camels bring gifts to the fore. They are distinguished terrorists from the Middle East, leading a Central American caravan. They have journeyed to where the star stops, at the border. Of course, much of what immigrants offer is not known upon their arrival. Barely visible in the distance, hordes of immigrant day laborers breach the barricade only to tend crops for below poverty wages without job security, benefits, or the protection of labor laws. The ghostly wall behind them becomes a backdrop for those who actually cultivate our sustenance. In Thailand, as well as elsewhere, there is the folk custom of derogatorily naming one's own children. This is so that demons who steal children will pass them over. Clearly, a child with an ugly name wouldn't be worth a demon's taking. Such naming also emotionally distances the family from their beloved children when they send them off in the hands of coyotes or human smugglers. And even the smugglers themselves in the role of being a coyote is an animalization of, uh, of a dehumanizing. It's a way of easing separation and providing children with their own special powers. The dog boy exhales smoke as powerfully as a volcano and wears a mighty jaguar on his visor hat. And protective armor adorned with many animals out racing pursuers. I made several works around the theme of conquistadors harvesting crops. The image of the migrant conquistador flip-flops between being a revenge fantasy of beneath minimum wage laborers rummaging through the spoils of a victory over invaders 
to that of lucky finders keepers in a bountiful field of discarded ornamented metal objects like some El Dorado gold. Occasionally, I write poems to accompany works. This one alludes to directives given to vegetable workers to protect the crops they pick, contrary to their own well-being. Sanguine faces in florid fields, florid tails with sanguine knives that cut stem from base without damage to the product. Turning the helmet upside down, we can better see the metal relief of a bound enslaved person kneeling before a magistrate. When we think of the extremis of refugee lives pitted against the historical consistency of forced mass migration of humanity, particularly in the last century, there is a discrepancy that is hard to reconcile, let alone to represent. This is what brings me back to the philosophies of perception of the early 11th century Chinese landscape painter, Guo Xi. The larger whole requires diverse lenses to properly portray a subject. The details of individual circumstances are specific, yet become part of a larger mass of struggle that, at further distance, yields uncomfortable patterns. The whole is dominated by absence, or put another way, the erasures and omissions are too large to ignore. Trauma consists of an inescapable loop of causal events, as well as the absence of amnesia or conscious repression. The drawings allude to this repetition, this fixation and its denial by allowing only bits and pieces of figuration to emerge. Here we see a no Northern Triangle logo that advocates for withholding aid to those countries with desperate conditions that push immigrants further North. Such policies only worsen the situation. Statelessness is a branding that burns as it takes what was given at birth. It not only separates distances and makes other, it tears to make less. The label of refugee is a stigma as well as punitive, sometimes arbitrary bureaucratic des designation. It is branded onto traumatized survivors from abroad who have not voluntarily fled, but have been forced to escape desperate life threatening circumstances. Such extreme poverty and sectarian violence, they find little protection along their way. Refugees are not lesser for their circumstances. They contribute much to the societies in which they assimilate. Our human rights to healthcare, education, employment belong to new arrivals too. They benefit us all. Integration into a host country is mostly a prolonged trial typically thwarted, seldom achieved, and almost never satisfactory. The familiar and precious things refugees often carry become merely forensic evidence. And Jason Leon's uh, tragic land of open graves is an amazing testament to this. For individuals, these experiences are points in time. For society, they are constants shifting demogra uh, demographics in ways that some find enriching and others threatening. Refugees live in internal impermanence beyond their control. It takes a psychological as well as physical toll. The story is still about resources. US oil companies and North American gold and silver mines still threaten, murder, and exploit. Some of these details are taken from mines that have become the only job in town, the toxic residue that is left behind, and of the dead who dared protest the environmental devastation and economic destitution. To quote Guo Xi, the landscape painter, distant mountains have no texture strokes, distant water has no waves, distant figures have no eyes. They do not really lack them, but merely seem to do so. People don't turn into refugees overnight. Becoming a refugee is a gradual process, a bleaching out, a transition into a ghostly existence. Ghosts don't die. Another poetic fragment. Fear the landscaper. The cucumber workers are having a field day. The Pulitzer Prize winning author Viet Tan Nguyen writes, what matters is that a thousand little anchors once moored you to the world. Becoming a refugee means watching as those anchors are severed one by one. 
until at last you're floating outside of society, an untethered phantom in need of a new life. And I will leave us there floating. Thank you. Suzanne and Andrew both, thank you so much um, for taking the time today and to just really sharing all this, your work um, that you've done and I, you know, that we have currently at the, at the museum. If you are uh, a member of the Queens College community, a student, staff or faculty, um, I invite you to come by and take a look at the works in person uh, because as Andrew mentioned, they are large works of art that really confront you. Um, so then I'm gonna ask you to mute uh, and Andrew as well, just to clear the, the background noise, thank you. Um, really confront you um, and you know, they really tell stories, these stories that are often untold, um, that are silenced, that people know perhaps, right? Where we see it, we hear it every single day about, immigrant crisis, refugee crisis, um, you know, who's coming into our country, right? We get confronted with this every single day. And yet, you know, most of the time we just get up and go on our way. Um, and here you, you know, you both have sort of elevated this platform and used your platform, right? Um, to confront this and to really talk about it. Um, I encourage anyone that has any questions for both Suzanne and Andrew, you feel free to just um, drop your question in the chat. If you feel like you um, you want to just unmute yourself and ask the question, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, I did have, um, let me just a quote. I know, um, Suzanne, there was a quote from you, you know, that really struck me, uh, you know, you said, whose lives are considered valuable, um, which is, something you know we don't really think about often, but it's so true for, for many people um, that this is happening. So um, you know, lots to, lots, lots to think about. Um, if uh, I just wanna mention, I think there was a question in the chat. Let me just look at it really quick. Um, and this question is for Andrew. Um, so your use of ink wash on paper is so effective. Um, your draftsmanship is spectacular. When did you learn this technique and why do you choose to use this method? Uh, yeah, I think the reasons are many, but I spent a couple of years in Japan many decades ago and was studying calligraphy. And uh, I did so because I didn't want to study painting because I thought that that would mess up with what my intentions were, but calligraphy was the core, right? The essence, learning how to use a brush and the philosophy behind trying to employ uh, the brush and the medium itself uh, and trying to instill meaning into the material. So sometimes I would actually collect water from uh, fields I was farming and mix it with mud uh, to uh, try to imbue the works with added meaning. But in this case, I think that it's also in a desire to bridge uh, Eastern and Western techniques in that when we look at a lot of the early Renaissance painters or draftsmen, uh, their brush techniques are quite similar to um, the kind of clarity and mark making. So it's both because of an austerity of means, I think, uh, a complete merging of the pigment into the paper rather than something being on the surface. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I am still in a many year predicament of finding doing anything else is kind of uh, decorative or cheating or uh, not fair somehow to uh, a complete, uh, you know, pretty bare bones renunciation of things. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Uh, Great. I actually want to just a follow up question on that because your work is very large scale. How do you and and the the stories that are told in in, in the works of art. Um, how do you start to think about them, right? So how do you take this concept, um, you know, 
the, these ideas, you know, everything that's, that they, we hear, read, how do you take these ideas, the concepts, and translate that? Can you walk us maybe through your process of how do you begin to sort of narrate the story through your art? Well, I, okay, yeah, I think that uh, just like Susani, we are reading a lot and we are engaged a lot in other um, uh, sources of information and doing so within sometimes a core image uh, sticks in your head and you start sketching that out. And then once I'm, I'm also trying to go for a, a kind of, reality uh, that I have to believe in. And so I'm spending much too much time making digital collages. Uh, but the reason I justify spending that amount of time is because um, uh, yeah, that's where the images grow and where I can keep working and manipulating and putting things together to make these complex narratives. And then it's after the fact that then I'll go and then actually execute them. And ironically, after spending all of this time meticulously working out compositions, once I actually am putting it on a piece, there are radical changes. But it's a, it's an, it's both an organic process as well as an extremely calculated one. Great. Suzanne, same similar question to, uh, for you as well. Can you walk us a little bit through your ideas, your process of um, creating? Again, your your a lot of your your works are very large scale. Um. Well, this is a different the, the work I showed tonight grew out of an earlier body of work uh, that was uh, these hand-painted interventions into uh, photographic images that I altered through Photoshop and printed out digitally, you know, as a kind of, you know, intervention into these scenes of wartime destruction. And then, you know, the linkage of war and unrest and violence and the linkage of that to the causes of migration and refugee crises kind of led me um, to this series. But part of what I was intervening in those images with were these excerpts from like Persian painting of garden scenes or gardeners or scenes, scenes of construction rather than destruction. And so I was really looking closely at, at you know, Andrew's talking about austerity. I, I'm in love with the decorative and I find ways to use the decorative to, you know, express what I want to express. So seeing all these gorgeous carpet designs and tree of, I've done another body of work about the tree of life motif, uh, mostly on in carpets across different cultures. Um, so that's what led me to the carpets and the idea of the magic carpets, but you know, not romanticized. Um, and and then more recently, the carpets have become a bit more austere in that they're not as decorative, but they have become the red carpet. And the red carpet, which actually has its own references in, in antiquity, um, as something we associate with welcoming and celebrity and special occasions. And the paintings I'm doing now, these red carpets are all tangled up in knots and they are not usable. They are not rolled out. They are pulled away and retracted. So yeah, it's just, I, I don't really, I don't know if I have like a linear progression of how I develop these images, but that's sort of what they came out of. Great, thank you. Um, let me see if there's any other questions in the chat. Um, I don't see any new questions. Um, again, feel free to um, submit um, any questions or unmute yourself. Like, oh, here's one. Uh, your work, okay, Suzanne, your work is so rich and layered. Do you look at each other's work and discuss? That's actually a really great question because you are professors. Do you find yourselves critiquing each other? Yeah, how does that, how does that work? We are together like 24 seven. We share a studio, we share our house and we share our office at school. We both teach at the same place. So, I mean, we're very, very lucky um, and that we love a lot of the same things. I mean, we have our differences in taste too, but we love a lot of the same things. 
Um, and yeah, we're always looking at each other's work and um, have made a couple of collaborative videos together. Um, that's really the only way we've actually created works together. But I think we're bouncing off of each other all the time. <gasps> oh my God, you scared me. <laughs> I could see that's you. Know. sense of humor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're bouncing off of each other oh all the God. time yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's so great. You, you mute for a moment <laughs> oh okay I'm mute. okay i also just wanted to say relative to um yeah how we deal with each other i would say that we are our own most harsh critics and uh also if you don't think that it was difficult to try to present something after Susani's presentation just now, then you have another thing coming. So uh, great admiration there too. <laughs> well, it's mutual. <laughs> ah. no, it's not. great. Oh. Um, I have a question, a quick question. Go ahead, Go ahead Louise. Andrew, do you ever exhibit the digital collages or do you really see those as studies that, that are private or how much, how much, I mean, what's the division between the study and the, the final work? Uh, well, it's a good point. I am going to be putting some of the digital collages in a next upcoming exhibition. And those were ones where sometimes depending on the collage and the degree of reality that I'm able to create in there, um i feel as though okay no this one doesn't make sense if it's rendered it has right. to just be the photographic source itself and that kind of naked extrapolation or juxtaposition of the imagery in the collages in other cases even though i've spent all this time on the collages they are still bits and pieces that haven't cohered or been able to submerge aspects of themselves. And therefore I have to go through them and actually execute them to get across the tenor. Often the collages don't have the uh, emotional tenor that I'm trying to get at, which can both be uh, light and sardonic, but also I hope uh, striking a sense of pathos. Yeah, and, de and deadly serious. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. all those things. <sighs> yeah, I don't think the collages have any of the humor. If there is humor in it, mm. it's not in the collages. <laughs> it's in the drawing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we are almost at time. Um, I do have one last question for both of you. Um, and it's actually great that you're both there on the same screen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for those of you that don't uh, know Queens College, we are located in Flushing, Queens, one of the most diverse neighborhoods um, in all of New York City. Um, our students and our student population is largely um, an immigrant population or first generation. Um, I myself, as a, an alumna of Queens College, um, an immigrant, I came to this country when I was eight years old. Um, so my question to you both is, for students that are walking in, um, looking at your works of art, what is it, you know, if, if there is something that you hope that they take away from this, or if there's something, a message or anything that you hope that they would get from looking at your works, um, what, what, would, what would that be? Yeah, that's a very hard question, you know, because especially, you know, as, as you're describing your own student body, I mean, you know, we, our families were immigrants, but we are not direct immigrants, immigrants, and we are, I hope we're not purporting to speak for immigrants. I, I would like to think that we're speaking more about mm -hmm. our lack of reception to our, our, our political and social response to immigrants. And, but I'm hoping that in our, our thinking and visualizing our thinking about this, that they, I'm hoping that they can recognize both the pain and the beauty of, of that experience mm -hmm. and our personal regret uh, and, you know, disgust for mm -hmm. what our, how our country has been.
um, because everybody's fine when it's their immigrant family that has made it and is safe mm -hmm. and sound. But then it's a whole different story when it's someone outside of their immediate sphere. And I know we're over time, so I'll just say that I hope that they would be able to find some of themselves in the pieces. And that if they don't, I hope that it would give them the, um, the push to, to want somehow to make themselves visible that way. Thank you so much. And you both do that so well in you know, the works in the exhibition. I do encourage you, if you are on the Queens College campus, uh, please visit the exhibition. We're hoping that maybe in the spring we'll be able to open to external visitors, um, which we were, you know, be so happy to welcome you all. Until then, I do encourage you to visit both our website at www.gtmuseum.org and also visit uh, both Suzani and um, Andrew's websites for um, a look into all of the works um, that they've, you know, so created so far. And again, you both do that so well. Thank you for using your platform as artists and activists to, you know, highlight these voices that for so long and are still are being silenced. So we thank you and we are so honored to have your work um, at the museum. So thank, thank you to you. everyone, of course, as well for joining us. Um, it was it was a, such a great evening. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for um, coming, everybody. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Um, we, I will follow up with an email to everyone that registered. Um, we, well, I will link also the recording to this um, talk in case you know of anyone that maybe has missed it or if you wanna just rewatch it again, of course. Um, so look out for an email from me, but um, until then, I will hope to see all of you at our next program um, that we'll be having. Check out our website for more information. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Andrew, Suzani, and all of you, of course, for joining us this evening. Uh, until next time. Thanks, everyone. Take Bye -bye. care.